Hey everyone, Dr. Crayhay here. I wanted to chime in and just add a few things that those Khan Academy videos didn't touch on. Uh, so starting up at the top, your textbook starts to talk about this idea of a population versus a sample. So for many of you, th these two concepts are are a review from our research methods class P211, uh, but for some it might be a bit new. So the idea here is uh, the population is whatever group you want to generalize to. So if you want to know what the average salary of psychologists in the United States is, and then your population includes every single psychologist in the United States. Uh, if you wanted to know the rates of texting and driving among teens in Indiana, for example, your population would then be all of the teens in Indiana, teen drivers in Indiana, I should say. Uh, so that is your um, your people of interest. So you have you know a very large group of people that you're interested in studying. So maybe it's um, all the people in the United States. Perhaps that is your population of interest. And again, this will change depending on the study that you're doing, uh, but you'll have some population in mind. Often in the social sciences, though, we simply don't have time to gather data from every single person in our population. So what we'll do is we'll take samples from hopefully representative samples from this population, right? So maybe we take 100,000 people uh, from that population and we say, okay, this is our sample, this group of people that we've pulled from the population, that is our sample. So it's a smaller group of people, it's a more manageable group of people um, that you're able to go, uh, you know, you can ask them questions, collect data from them, you have to spend time with these people, which is why we can't uh, typically get information from everyone of interest, so instead we just take a smaller sample. There's some different notations here. Uh, typically with a population, you're going to say that's the big N, your sample will be a small N. So again, denoting full population or a piece of that population. So that's population versus sample. Most often in this course and in the social sciences in general, we'll be dealing with samples and we'll talk about that much, much more as we move forward. Now moving to our measures of central tendency, we have something called the mean. The mean is the mathematical balance point of your data. So I always think of, uh, you know, one of those literal, you know, you've kind of got a little line here, maybe like a kind of a seesaw situation where all of your data lie across this point right here. Your mean, if you could kind of balance on the mean, uh, that is your mathematical balance point. It's the exact center of your data such that 50% will lie above the mean and 50% of your data will lie below the mean. So it's the mathematical balance point. So mathematical balance point. So just the center of your data, 50% will of your data will fall above this number, 50% will fall below. Uh, again, we have some notation to talk about. So with a population, you'll have something like this. Uh, we call that mu, kind of like mu. Um, that's for a population mean. Very rarely will we actually have a population mean. More often, you'll see this big M, which stands for sample mean. You might also see the sample mean represented like this. Uh, you might read that X bar. Um, this is what I tend to use X bar. That's just what I've always used. It's what I've been trained with. However, this is very difficult to insert into Microsoft Word. So this capital M is what you'll see most often. You also didn't get uh, your formula in those 
Excel or those uh, Khan Academy videos, pardon me. So to calculate your mean, you're going to take the sum. So this uh, weird E looking guy, that's Greek Sigma. So uh, Sigma X, the sum of X, the sum of all of your data points divided by N, small n, your number of data points. So if I have data from five people, I'll be dividing by five and I'll add up those five scores up here. So that's how you calculate the mean. Uh, we'll be doing that quite a bit in this week's homework and as we push forward in the course. Overall, the mean is an excellent measure of central tendency. Uh, it is probably the most commonly used measure. Uh, it gives a really good sense of kind of the center of your data. Um, on the downside of the mean though, it is very sensitive to outliers. So remember outliers are those extreme points. They can be way above everyone else, way below everyone else, but for whatever reason, they don't follow the same kind of trend. Those will greatly influence your mean. So thinking back, uh, you know, to our, I don't even want that, thinking back to our uh, box plots. So if I drew a box plot right here, so remember we have a box in the middle that represents the majority of our data. You'll have some lines in here and then you'll have little whiskers coming off of the top and the bottom. Outliers will be represented in SPSS with a little asterisk. So here is an asterisk. This outlier right here will force your mean to be arbitrarily lower than it would be otherwise. So here's the bulk of your data, but you have an outlier here that will pull your mean down. Likewise, say we have a different situation. We've got our box. We've got our whiskers. Say you have an outlier over here. This outlier will arbitrarily pull your mean up. It will make it larger. So the mean overall really excellent. You'll see it in probably every single research article you ever come across. But please do keep in mind that uh, the mean is very sensitive to outliers. Some people will use a weighted mean because of this. Uh, so please do read in your textbook about that weighted mean. We also have the median, another good measure of central tendency. You might see that abbreviated MDN. That's how I'll do that. Um, calculate that. This one is actually uh, pretty easy. So median n plus one over two. So if I have a set of data, uh, you know, you don't even have to actually do math. You can just arrange them out from the smallest number to the biggest number and then find that central point. And that's what this will help you to find. So your number of data points plus one divided by two, that will give you the location of your median and you can find it in the center there. The median is not as susceptible to outliers. <clears throat> Pardon me. So what you'll see is if I have a data set that has some outliers in it, perhaps I'll report the mean and the median. Uh, some people might opt to uh, include just the median uh, because this is a good measure of central tendency when you have outliers. Not used as frequently as the mean, but again, very useful when you have outliers. We also have a mode, so I always remember mode, M-O, most frequent, most frequent score. Uh, so we've talked about this uh, both last week and this week. We don't tend to use the mode very often uh, in social science research. Um, you might see it in some very specific situations, but it doesn't tend to give us very um, informative information. So maybe I would use this if I was looking at class status. So we have freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and I want to know what, uh, you know, what my class looks like. Do I have mo mostly seniors? Do I have mostly sophomores? You know, what is that uh, that demographic look like. So with the mode, I could see, okay, I have mostly juniors, and then that could help me adjust the difficulty of the course. So it can be very useful, but it's limited in when it can uh, help you out. 
couple of additional things that the Khan Academy videos didn't touch on. You can have a bimodal distribution. You can have a multimodal distribution. You can also have no mode. So let's talk about those real quick. So say that I have my raw scores here on the bottom. Let's just say one, two, three, and four, just to keep it kind of simple. And then put the frequency over here. Uh, so say we have, uh, let's go ahead and demarcate these, one, two, three, and then up at the top we've got four. So say, you know, one person scores a one, we've got two people here that scored a two, uh, maybe we have three people that scored a three, and maybe also three people that scored four. So in this case, we have two modes. So three people scored a three, three people scored a four. That's what's called a bimodal distribution. If we had four people that scored four rather than three, our mode would be four only. Say on the other hand that we had four people that scored four, four people that scored three, and four people that scored two. This is a situation where we would have no mode. So if you start getting to kind of three or more greater than or equal to three, you would have no mode in that situation and that does tend to happen. So those are our three main measures of central tendency, mean, median, mode. Of course, they're all useful in their own situations. You'll see the mean most often, but remember, susceptible to outliers. So you might add in a median in addition to that mean. The mode can tell you what is most frequent. Um, so they're all useful in their own ways. Your textbook and also your homework starts to ask you questions about what will happen if you add, subtract, multiply, divide a certain number. Um, maybe you add three to your mean, what will happen? Uh, go ahead and calculate those out so that you get a good sense of, of what's going on there. Calculate, you know, one, try it twice, and you'll see the overall patterns. If you're changing the mean, it, it changes in very predictable ways. Um, I talked a bit about what would happen if you added a score above the mean, if you added a score below the mean. Go ahead and try some of those calculations out too. Think about, you know, if you have that balancing bar and you add something on the right hand side, you know, your balancing point would tip so you'd have to move that mean to the right a little bit. It would have to be a little bit higher. If you added one directly on that balance point, would you need to move the mean to keep it balanced or, or make it stay the same? So those are some of your questions. Uh, in the homework this week. One kind of final thing that I wanted to touch on uh, is this idea of skew and kurtosis. So let me write these out real quick. We've got skew and kurtosis. So these are all uh, describing shapes of distribution. So we have this um, bell-shaped curve. It's a normal distribution. We'll talk about that coming up very soon where um, right here smack dab in the middle all three of our measures of central tendency will fall. Our mean, our median, our mode. That's what's called a normal distribution. Again we'll touch on that more. Um, actually it might be in two weeks but we'll get to it soon enough. This is not always the case, right? So we could have a skewed distribution. Skew is going to tell us, uh, so looking at, you know, how is the data shaped? So this is a skewed distribution, right? So if you look at a histogram and you see this, uh, you know that this is skewed. To figure out how it's skewed, we have positive skew, we have negative skew. Look at where that tail is pointing. So it's pointing towards kind of the negative numbers. Uh, so this is a negative skew, a negative skew. Uh, you could also, of course, have a positive skew or kind of you got the bulk there and your tail goes out to the right. Pardon my bad drawing. That's going to be positive skew. So skew is going to tell you left or right, you know, are they kind of off to the left or right. Kurtosis is going to tell you um, kind of up or down. So you could have really 
compressed uh, figures like that or distributions like that you could have where they're like really 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 tall kind of like that and that's going to be a um, kurtotic or you could just say you know we're measuring kurtosis here these are visual ways to assess skew and kurtosis there are also numeric ways uh, that we'll talk about so just jot down in your notes if it's between negative 2 and positive skew uh, positive 2 for skew or kurtosis, so you get one single number representing the skew of your distribution, the kurtosis of your distribution. If that number is between negative 2 and positive 2, you're okay. You do not have skew problems. You do not have kurtosis problems. So that's a good uh, kind of guideline for you there on skew and kurtosis. Again, we'll talk about this more as we push forward in the course, but for now, uh, we'll stop, and if you have any questions, please do let me know.